In this talk, I'll try to uh, tell you in a somewhat expository uh, fashion, several stories. So this like uh, a plot of a movie, uh, stories of several different characters. And uh, of course you can look at them individually uh, and that maybe is good if you prefer, if you get bored of one, there will be something else coming soon. But uh, as in typical movie, they interweave and interact with each other. So they're meant to be uh, considered together with lots of interconnections. And uh, my first story starts um, about 20 years ago, um, or precisely 19 years ago, when I arrived to Harvard as a young uh, fellow. I didn't actually know any number theory nor three manifold topology, which are subjects of today's talk. Um, and uh, I met this uh, wonderful person who told me about arithmetic topology and a magical and mysterious connection that's supposed to relate uh, the world of three manifolds and uh, Iwasawa theory or more general subjects in, in number theory. So that was Barry Mazur. And we had many interesting conversations ever since, but uh, from the beginning of uh, these discussions, I was very captivated by uh, magical connection where uh, two completely different worlds are being related. And in the abstract, I mentioned that uh, this um, connection is somewhat similar to Langland's program. And I see several uh, conceptual similarities in the sense that uh, both uh, rest on lots of facts, which sometimes are do not hold in full generality, but um, provide the guidance of where we should look for relations, connections. And in each case, there are uh, pesky exceptions, which usually escape uh, the precise bijection, and that becomes a uh, major motivation for discovering new delicate phenomena and so on. Um, this subject of arithmetic topology, this link uh, between a three manifold topology and number theory uh, is mostly based on analogy of uh, taking covers in the world of number fields and in the world of three manifolds. So anything that um, um, can be phrased in terms of taking covers usually has a good chance to be realized as part of this structure. And um, back then 20 years ago, uh, I immediately got excited about it and started thinking whether there is any um, chance of the structure being realized in physics. So this is a um, website. Uh, uh, so uh, you can go there and check out the dictionary uh, involving the three manifolds and, and uh, number fields, uh, various attempts, history, and so on. And, uh, in my early days uh, back then, when I was talking to Barry, I in fact tried to contribute to, to this development. So that was how I got into this story. And um, maybe as part of the dictionary, so that's if you scroll down on that website, that's, that's what you're going to see. And um, as part of the dictionary, you'll find that um, 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 Galois group plays important role here and corresponds roughly speaking to the fundamental group in the world of uh, three manifolds. And that's another analogy with geometric Langlands program where uh, Galois group is also replaced by fundamental group on the geometric side. So again, there are quite a few of these similarities. So this program, arithmetic topology was conceived in 60s uh, by Perry, uh, by uh, other people, including Yuri Manian and others. And um, it basically was developed in various stages throughout the years. Uh, there was a lot of work in 90s, so it received a lot of momentum. And maybe that's why uh, when I came to Harvard in 2001, I was lucky to uh, witness uh, the post uh, revolution of, 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 of this development. Um, Oops, uh, somehow my slides froze. Oh, here it is. So um, I won't describe all of the uh, links uh, in this dictionary, but it's a good motivation for us. And it's good to know that there is a program and a goal to, to make this connection. And in his famous paper in 60s on the Alexander polynomial, uh, Barry uh, outlined various connections. And like I said, many of the connections that work really well involve operations of taking covers. 
And uh, Alexander polynomial on the topology side can be defined using covers. So therefore, Barry wrote the whole paper called uh, uh, with Alexander polynomial in a title. And he tried to revisit various properties. Uh, one of the famous properties of the Alexander polynomial uh, that for any knot it has reciprocity, namely if you evaluate it at inverse argument one over T, it returns uh, same polynomial as a function of T. So Barry was uh, in this uh, old paper from 60s uh, asking question about the number theory analog of it. And uh, this is one of the questions that got me thinking, uh, what would be the physics origin of the symmetry? In physics, we know that symmetries are very important. So once you understand some property of a system in terms of symmetry, it uh, usually holds the key to understanding, deeper understanding of the entire phenomenon. So I was kind of captivated by, by this reciprocity. And Curiously, a few months later, I realized that it actually has something to do. So this binary operation of taking argument to its inverse can be understood as a while symmetry uh, of SL2C. So while group of SL2C is just Z2. And if you think about that symmetry, it relates eigenvalue X to one over X. And uh, somehow that's actually the surprisingly has something to do with this Alexander polynomial and its property um, of inverting the argument. So where did this come from and uh, how did this happen? Well, uh, back then uh, there was another uh, person visiting Harvard, uh, Fernando Rodriguez Villegas, and uh, he was giving a course on Borel regulators, block groups, and it also involved topology of three manifolds and number theory, but of a somewhat different kind. Like I said, I had no clue back then uh, what three manifold theory was and I wasn't an expert and I'm not expert now on number theory, but it was also very captivating. And uh, in particular, it wasn't clear to me if this has any connection with arithmetic topology. So many of the things that Fernando was presenting in the course, as I realized later were part of uh, his work in progress with David Boyd and Nathan Dunfield. So he had a series of papers with David Boyd, um, and, and this is one of them uh, below in the acknowledgments that thanks Harvard Math Department for hospitality during the year. And um, as I realize now, it's a good way to uh, teach a course uh, where, where you incorporate foundations of what you use in your research. And uh, back then, Fernando was interested in a polynomials. And um, uh, one of the highlights was the computation of Miller measures of A polynomials. Surprisingly, if you take A polynomial of a node, uh, in this case uh, shown as a figure eight node, you would find that uh, it equals to hyperbolic volume of the knot complement. So that's one of the things uh, or kind of things that Fernando was explaining from several perspectives. And um, that's where block groups came in and many other exciting things. And again, a question I was trying to ask myself is, why would that happen? So how, how can we understand this phenomenon and what do they have uh, to do in common? Because uh, some of this phenomena seemed somewhat experimental. So they worked in some cases and other cases they required modification. And uh, it, it, it was not entirely clear, uh, kind of like an arithmetic topology. What is the precise statement about bijection that holds universally always? And finding such statements seemed kind of difficult. Um, and perhaps motivated by uh, Fernando's lectures and talking to him, uh, soon I got interested in understanding the structures in the context of Trent-Simons theory, where um, a polynomial itself can be uh, realized in a very nice way as a moduli space of flat SL2C connections. So here the gauge group would be SL2C, and that's going to be the case for my entire talk. I'll, I'll talk only about SU2 as compact group or SL2C as a complex group. And um, then uh, many of this phenomena, including the one shown on the previous slide where a Miller measure is expressed as volume of a hyperbolic knot complement can be understood in the context of um, complex Trent-Simons theory with this uh, gauge group uh, SL2C where on 
uh, in Chern Simons theory on the Riemann surface, you would quantize the space of flat connections on that Riemann surface. If your two manifold is just a torus, it's quantization of very simple character variety, C star cross C star mod Z2. Uh, so it has symplectic form uh, D log X, D log Y. And uh, uh, that's, that's this axis and Ys uh, you'll see later in the talk. Uh, if you quantize a um, particular function on this variety, namely the A polynomial, you quickly get uh, lots of cool things, including uh, Chern Simon's partition function, which can be thought of as a wave function of system whose Hamiltonian levels are basically given by the A polynomial. You get quickly to the subject of spectral curves, quantum curves, and all that. So this will come in later in, in the talk. Uh, at this point, I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself, but um, I just wanted to uh, tell you where I started uh, with this. And uh, many of the questions that were fascinating to me back in the day, both from arithmetic topology and uh, from Fernandez course on uh, Borel regulators, Meller measures, are still uh, part of the motivation and how I even got them to thinking about these things. But um, is, is this particular slide going to be very important about the quantization of SLC? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back uh, to it. Yes, I was planning to, to come back to the slide. But okay. if you have a question about it, feel free to ask now. Yeah, if, if it's relevant, then um, aren't you assuming that the um, that the holonomies are simultaneously diagonalizable? Uh, correct, yes. So here- so there's, it, there's, another, there's another branch of the moduli space which has to be quantized, right? Uh, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. So, uh, right, so in this, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about C star cross C star mod Z2. So that's indeed a general component of a space of flat connections, where I'm assuming that uh, both holonomies are semi-simple and that actually will be enough for everything I'm going to say in, in this talk. Uh, right. that's, so not there are, really, that's not really what H of T2 is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the quantization of the moduli space of flat connections. Uh, that's, that's correct. Uh, so again, it's infinite dimensional space and uh, the, uh, some aspects of, of uh, this infinite dimensional space which take into account those states uh, will be important uh, in various other things. For instance, last year we did work with Nakajima, Dupay, and others uh, on what, where this plays a role. But in my today's talk, it won't play a role at all. So I, I'll, I'll just gloss over these things. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. If I were more technical, I would include those states. Yeah. Okay. So I also have a quick question. Yeah. Is is this SL2C relationship to the Alexander polynomial related to how? Um, SU2 in Stanton Fleur homology is related to the Alexander polynomial? That I don't know. That's a, that's, that's a good question. Here it's um, uh, related um, in the form of, um, so what this SL2C Chern Simons theory does for you, it puts uh, two statements under the same roof. One is known as volume conjecture, that's about SL2C hyperbolic volumes and that kind of things where a polynomial naturally comes in. And another is a version of it, which is uh, called rosansky melman morton conjecture that relates uh, chern simons theory to Alexander polynomial. So if in these two relations, you compose them and eliminate the word chern simons you get relation between a polynomial and Alexander polynomial. So that's where it comes in. So that's how symmetry, while symmetry of SL2 becomes uh, reciprocity symmetry of Alexander polynomial. And then I guess I'm sort of curious if you if you delete an Alexander polynomial and try to say you have relation between instanton Fleur homology and Chern uh, uh, Simons theory. Yeah. So that that's that's a more uh, interesting subject on which uh, I have. Uh, it, it's, it's a little peripheral to what I was going to tell you. I'll come to something similar a bit later, but um, yeah. There no, are, I was just curious. Um, I mean, in that case, uh, there are spectral sequences, of course, which uh, usually relate homology theories, uh, including the one that categorifies Alexander polynomial. At the level of Alexander polynomial itself, uh, it's... Um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little more uh, elusive in, 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 in that case. And, um, but anyway, so uh, it's, 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 it's uh, 
in, in this case, uh, symmetry of Alexander polynomial is just while symmetry of SL to C from, from, from this perspective. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, all I want to say about it. Um, right. So another topic that I need to introduce or that, that needs to enter the stage, and that's where some of our stories will be involve uh, chiral CFTs. And uh, I won't even review this in detail. I have a big yellow book in my office uh, where um, if you study fusion rules and uh, uh, generalized conformal dimensions, you quickly see that in rational chiral CFTs, they end up being in number fields. So uh, even basic textbooks on conformal field theory quickly get us in a territory of relation between number fields and chiral CFTs. So therefore, it's natural to consider this triage uh, together where we have questions number theory, topology, and chiral CFT and ask other relations, in particular, are there relations between topology and chiral CFTs? Um, and the answer, of course, is yes. In fact, um, uh, Algebraic structures that I'll be talking about today uh, did play a very important role in topology since early days. Uh, and the way we usually use them is that in formulating topological problem, we usually put some representation theory or algebraic input. So for instance, if you want to define a two-dimensional TQFT, we need to specify Frobenius algebra and theorem says that given one, you can construct a 2D TQFT. The idea is very simple. Basically, 2D TQFT should associate Hilbert space to circles, and that's going to be our underlying space of the Frobenius algebra. Product is uh, what will correspond to pair of bands, and then everything else just falls in place. The algebraic structure is perfectly suited for uh, what we need to define a TQFT. The same thing works on the level of three manifolds, where um, Algebraic structures that enter are a little bit more interesting. And uh, they were studied in context of conformal field theory, in particular by Greg and Nati Seiberg uh, in their famous work on CFTs. Uh, so then based on work of Witten and also his work with Rishitikin, Turaev proved the, what's now known Turaev's theorem, a general statement that if you give uh, me or anyone else a modular tangent category, that's a package. Uh, which includes a lot of things and modular data, since uh, I want the connections with number theory, probably modular is going to be a crucial part for me, then uh, you can associate to this package a three-dimensional TQFT so that there is a perfect marriage between algebraic structure and what topological field theory and topological invariants require. So the only twist is that in the stories I'm going to tell you, we'll use this uh, flow of information in Sergey, that, yeah. that theorem applies, it assumes unitarity or not? Uh, so traditional theorem assumes uh, unitarity, semi-simplicity, but then there are various deviations. Uh, in fact, by now there are many of these versions which actually go even beyond unitary, beyond semi-simple. And depending how many of uh, conditions we relax, this gets us uh, closer or further away from cutting edge of the development. So now, um, people who work on MTCs and connection to TQFTs, this is actually a very hot topic to relax some of these assumptions. But, 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 but I, I mean, I always had the impression that this was a statement for unitary uh, correct. categories. And, and in, in old days, the answer is yes. So traditional derived theorem, uh, the answer is yes. But actually even himself, he continued working through late nineties, trying to relax these assumptions. Okay. So the, 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 I mean, you know. in the in the Frobenius algebra, two D TQFT. Of course, you can have non semi simple Frobenius algebras. No? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, there, it's a little, uh, but it's also still a good question, actually. Yeah. Even relax some of the assumptions on two D. It gets a little easier to answer because we're algebraic structure is simpler, TQFT is simpler, but. Yeah, in the world of three manifolds, uh, some of these questions, if we relax too much, uh, they still uh, stand as uh, really cutting edge of the field. Yeah. So for example, for some of the non-semi-simple and non-unitary MTCs, that's, uh, that's what many people are trying to develop right now. Um, in fact, we'll encounter such uh, deviations from traditional MTC. I'm going to call the corresponding structures by uh, that name, but it's a misnomer because, in fact, uh, the way we'll encounter it in our story is that 
uh, will encounter deviations from uh, traditional rational CFTs, so they're not going to be rational or unitary in general, and same for tensor categories, but uh, perhaps one of the most surprising things is that the flow of information will be backwards. Instead of uh, using this as an input data to define invariance of three manifolds, these structures themselves will be characterizing invariance of three manifolds. So that to me is, uh, at least personally, is, is more surprised that everything moves backwards. And if there is one big takeaway from this entire talk, then that's the message I want to convey that something like a character of chiral CFT will be invariant of a three manifold or perhaps uh, a modular tensor category where by modular tensor category, I mean, uh, in general, some category with relaxed conditions such as unitarity or semi simplicity. So the connection goes through physics and uh, I won't actually say much about physics, uh, but I want you to know that it's uh, behind, under the hood in, in this uh, whole construction. And um, if physics involves a physics of three dimensional so-called N equals two theories uh, called T of M3 associated to this three manifold. So this physical theory is itself is a big and complicated invariant of a three manifold. And if you look at certain questions in that theory, compute partition functions, such as so-called 2D, 3D half index, uh, that's what's going to give us a character of a chiral algebra. That's going to be, in some sense, the star of my talk today. Uh, if you ask some other questions, for example, look at moduli spaces of vacua, you'll find moduli space of all complex connections, including the components that Greg correctly emphasized. And um, if you look at other questions, physical questions such as uh, twisted indices or spectrum of line operators, you're going to find the structure that I'm going to call MTC, uh, even though, again, I emphasize it's not always uh, MTC in a traditional mathematical sense, it's just a some braided category. Um, and last but not least, I should mention that everything I'm going to tell you, this is a survey and I'll cover, I'll try to give a big picture without going too far in details, but feel free to ask. Or if you're interested, uh, various details can be found in those two papers uh, with Putra Vafa, Naranda Cheng, Sung Bong Chun, Ferrari, and Sarah Harrison. Okay. Um, so I'll mostly focus on characters of chiral algebras to adhere to uh, the title of the talk and uh, feel uh, some of the connections in this magic relation between topology and number theory and chiral algebras. Um, but I want you to know that there are other things uh, of the same nature where you associate invariance to manifolds, which are not numbers, but rather algebraic structures, such as MTC. Uh, I'll say just a few words about this because that's also something you can attach to a three manifold. Uh, and I won't say anything at all about four manifolds where there is analogous story, but uh, I won't talk about this at all today. But the reason I bring this slide up is that I want to answer the following question that at least one this, this correspondence uh, produced MTC or chiral character as, as invariant of a three manifold, I personally was surprised. And the initial question was, where does it come on from? It's, it's very strange invariant. Why would it be reasonable? And um, it actually works well in conjunction with a statement that to a four manifold, you can also associate a vertex algebra, a completely different one. But then if you want this package to be functorial, namely, if you want to be able to cut and glue four manifolds, natural question is what shall you associate to a three manifold? In other words, if you cut a four manifold in pieces that share a common boundary and want to perform a gluing, in fact, MTC is the most natural answer because MTC controls representations of two vertex algebras. And if you want to form a, some sort of gluing of two vertex algebras, it's most natural to ask for MTC to be that interface that uh, shares a common data along which you can do the gluing. There is a mathematical uh, name for it in terms of extensions of vertex algebras. And we can perform this extension when two VOAs share a common MTC. So that's actually, therefore, not too surprising or not too strange that to a three manifold, we wish to associate 
and modular tensor category. Uh, uh, Sergey, could I ask a brief question? Yeah. So could you move to the previous slide just briefly? Yeah. yeah. Ah, I see, I guess you already said it. So it, it, the modular tensor category is an invariant of the three manifold. That's what you said, right? Yeah. So is this using some 60 theory or something like that? It is, it is. In fact, even in the previous slide, so this theory, that physical theory that uh, I'll keep under the hood is obtained by taking 6D theory on a three manifold. Yeah, okay, that's see. exactly, that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, you also remind me, I should have pointed out, I made it even, a more remote connection to four manifolds, which I won't be talking about, but uh, I will be talking about, about the scalar algebras of three manifolds and also MTC of three manifolds a little bit. And the relation between them is also meaningful because you can ask, uh, what is the category of representations of my Carroll algebra assigned to a three manifold? And uh, that will make a link to MTC of M3. So there are several interrelations. In among these objects that I'll be talking about. But for the rest of the talk, I'll focus a little bit on this MTC of M3 and uh, more on, on the corresponding chiral algebras. So very briefly, this uh, MTC of M3, I'll, I'll, I won't describe the full data of a tensor category, but I'll try to describe interesting uh, aspects which has to do with modular data, SNT matrices. And therefore you can think of uh, this as a growth in the group of MTC of M3. It's a vector space that carries an action of uh, SL to Z. And very roughly as a zeroth order approximation to what this vector space is, it's a space of um, SL to C or more generally you can try to do it for other complex group, flat connections on the three manifold. So if you have a Poincaré sphere, for example, Poincaré sphere admits uh, a Heger decomposition by genus two surface. So then you can ask about flat connections, SL2C flat connections on genus two surface, which can be extended either into one handle body or another handle body. This will give you Lagrangians inside uh, modular flat spaces of flat connections on the Riemann surface itself. So you get two holomorphic Lagrangians in Hitchin moduli space intersecting at three points. And this will be two, or oh, sorry, three, the three points correspond to three SL2C connections on the Poincaré sphere. So roughly speaking for Poincaré sphere, we would say that uh, there is SL2Z action on a three dimensional vector space, right? But to get closer to the better version of the answer or to formulate it more precisely, uh, we have to embed this problem into a gauge theory setup where this moduli space of flat connections comes out naturally. And uh, that's the Hilbert space of four dimensional n equals four supering mills twisted on three manifold cross time. So on four manifold, which is R cross N3. So the usual technology of Fleur type homology will associate the Hilbert space to, to the three manifold. And this Hilbert space won't be the same three dimensional space I just described. So if you apply it to Poincaré sphere or in fact any other manifold, you'll get something huge, something infinite dimensional. And the main reason is because reducibles contribute to this Hilbert space. So this can be viewed as waffer witten theory on a three manifold or, or Kapustin-Witten twist there they give the same Hilbert space. And that Hilbert space is basically going to be infinite dimensional space of states isomorphic to state space of har uh, harmonic oscillator or cohomology of CP infinity or equivariant S1 equivariant cohomology of a point. They all are the same space and that's what's going to be this SL2C Fleur homology roughly speaking. However, what's interesting is that, uh, um, so, so this example is for a three sphere, but what's interesting is that if you try to run a physics computation, the physics computation finds a way to regularize this infinity. And uh, this is pretty interesting because instead of infinite states for a three sphere, infinite set of states, it just gives uh, answer one. Uh, and that's the index of, of this theory T of S3, which in physical context uh, leads you to Batanzat's equations and various other things. Um, again, that's not terribly important. There is uh, the message I want to get from this is that there is a way to regularize it. 
And this regularization actually makes contact with several other mathematical invariants, all of which aim, roughly speaking, to define this SL2C fluor homology of three manifolds. And they also produce something nice and finite rather than infinite. So um, in particular, all of these methods seem to agree. And uh, one of them was recently developed by uh, Abu Zaid and Manalescu using perverse sheaves on character varieties. So we still talk about this SL2C character varieties. And if you include reducibles, then for Poincaré sphere, they would give us same three-dimensional space. And uh, if you look at the skein module, that's another invariant of a three-manifold, and look at it over C of Q, you would also get a three-dimensional space for Poincaré sphere, just like uh, physics regularization predicts. But now we can borrow a very important fact from this 4dn equals 4 superang meals, namely that it has a cell 2z action. And as a result, what you get is not just a vector space, which is after this regularization is finite dimensional, but actually you get a cell 2z representation as NT matrices acting on this finite dimensional space. Physics gives you a way to compute eigenvalues uh, and matrix elements of SNT matrices. So values uh, of T matrix, which is usually written on diagonal basis, are determined by transcendence and variance of this uh, flat connections. Again, for Poincaré here, we had three of them. So you could take those guys and assemble them in T matrix. And there is a similar way, which I won't describe, but again, I gave you some of the references which you can use to find elements of S metric. So for Poincaré sphere, you get uh, basically the Ising model, um, S and T matrices. Uh, so that's a representation of size three. So you have three by three matrices and you can try to run it for other manifolds. So another example I give here is, is a three torus where in the case of uh, SL2C, the scan module was actually known but computed actually fairly recently in 2017, 18. It's nine dimensional. So that agrees with the index uh, of this theory T of M3, which produces the same regularization, the same answer, but uh, physics allows you to quickly make predictions by extending this to other manifolds as on the previous slide or to higher ranks as on this slide, for instance, you can make a prediction for what scan module should be if you work for uh, with, with high rank groups. And as far as I know, this is mathematically still has not been verified. So this, this gives you this kind of technology, but the takeaway is that the um, um, physics uh, produces a very interesting way of regularizing infinity. In this case, infinite dimensional fluor homology, SL2C fluor homology comes out to be finite dimensional. And uh, it has this S and T matrices and uh, what this will have to do with the rest of the talk is that uh, the characters I'm going to describe for you also, of course, have S and T matrices, and there is a connection between these two things. How does physics get rid of the problem with the reducibles in the uh, floor homology? Uh, to be honest, the, to me, this is still uh, somewhat mysterious. Uh, we. Uh, formulate the problem as uh, asking about the Hilbert space of this theory T of M3. And uh, the easiest thing is to compute index. So here on the slides, I use the index, which is the trace of it, which would be in, unless there are constellations kind of like a- really, I'm confused. The Hilbert space of T of M3 would be associated to a two manifold. Uh, exactly, exactly. So you would study the so-called- oh, I'm sorry, M3 is the Poincaré sphere. Yeah, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you ask uh, in six dimensions, the setup involves time uh, across a three manifold, across a two torus. Right. So, and then and, and you, you use different ways of compactifying it. But what's interesting is that a uh, phenomenon that we know and love in localization computations and physics of 3DN equals two theories, uh, even if Hilbert space of this series on a two torus or any other Riemann surface is infinite dimensional, it gets rephrased as a finite sum over finitely many roots of beta and Zatz equations, which are um, critical points of twisted superpotential. And that's actually what controls this, uh, this finiteness. So there is a lot to be said and uh, very roughly, uh, 
it boils down, if you translate it to geometry, in this case of, say, Poincaré sphere, to the fact that um, if I do it via Heger splitting, yes, there are three intersection points between these Lagrangians. But uh, in that presentation, I ignored reducibles, which would still give infinity. And, and I think it's worth studying it more carefully by trying to translate how this physics technology of 3D and equals two theories uh, does it in the language of um, Fleury type theory. So hey, that's next. Uh, so I, also, um, for the SU2 case, you're saying that in this table at the bottom of your slide, these, these are predictions of physics that haven't been verified mathematically? As far as I know, yeah. Uh, what, didn't Bonahan and Wang work out the scheme modules for SU2? Oh, for SU2, yes. What I'm saying is that uh, for high rank, for example, for SU6, you get 252. And I don't know if mathematicians uh, have independent. Oh, okay, but for SU2, this agrees, I guess. But... Yeah, yeah. For, for SU2, the, the number nine is, is known, and that's a good start. But for high rank, as far as I know, that's a prediction from physics. Um, uh, Sergey, if it's not if it's not too long and doesn't take you for too far afield, can you say a word about how the physics gives you these predictions? Um, let, let's come back to this in the discussion session afterwards because uh, it is a bit long, and uh, that, that's why, like I say, I'll, I'll give a survey picture. My job is to whet your appetite, but uh, uh, there are some details which I'll be happy to explain in detail, but. Um, as I honestly emphasize and uh, answer to Greg's question, I think there is more to be done, especially if you want to rewrite the answer in terms of either scan module uh, or, or in terms of uh, analysis of PDEs and fluor homology. I think there is more to be understood there, translating how, how this beta and Zatz equations produce for you a finite answer. Okay. I'm actually, as you can see, what I'm doing in this talk, I'm trying to highlight all the things I find exciting, cool, and some of them are mysterious, like this regularization, which yeah. normally would be swept under the rug, but I'm trying, as I'm presenting these topics, to emphasize things that, in my opinion, should be understood better or developed more, or where I see opportunities, uh, such as this regularization. And I'm yeah. glad you guys uh, are identifying them and, and that they're noticeable. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next story. I promised you several stories that, that will be intertwining, interweaving, and can you guess what this is? There's a barcode on my uh, no. <laughs> Almost, yes, that's right. So when I show this slide, uh, it, it, it reminds me of, of this famous painting, of course, depending uh, how you look at it, you may see different things in, in, in this picture. But of course, what that picture was showing is, is, is percolation. So that's what I was aiming at. And um, here are several close cousins of percolation. So now I go back to physics. And uh, so these three physical systems uh, share one thing in common. So one class of physical systems or one physical system is a Q-state POTS model, which is a generalization of Ising model introduced by POTS in uh, 50s, where spins allow to have Q different values. So this uh, model has very interesting phase transition when Q is equal to four, but uh, what we're going to do is push it to opposite limit where Q goes to one. In other words, uh, the model seems to become trivial because uh, if spins are allowed to have only one value, then what's, what's there to talk about? But what's interesting that if you consider this family of CFTs uh, as, a, as a family and then take the limit, uh, indeed, many things become trivial. For example, central charge becomes zero, but theory does not become trivial at all and it describes percolation. Another family of models, which is also generalization of Ising model is called ON model. That's another generalization where uh, instead of spins with discrete sort of values, you're allowed to talk about um, spins in n-dimensional vector space and they have ON symmetry. And uh, taking limit n equals one gives you Ising. That's where O1 is basically plus one or minus one. But again, we can play the same game and try to make the model trivial by 
extrapolating from this entire family. And that in this case would be the limit for n goes to zero. So O zero is of course nothing. So there is nothing to talk about, but it gives yet another interesting statistical system of self-avoiding random walks. So um, um, another third model is a uh, quantum hole effect. And I won't discuss it in detail, uh, but if you look at uh, plateau phase transitions, they also have uh, something in common with uh, these two previous systems. And what they have in common is that they can all be described by conformal field theory, but not the usual kind of conformal field theory that we encounter in textbooks, in this yellow book, for example, that I mentioned. It's not rational, and moreover, it's not even unitary. So the um, example that I showed earlier has C equals zero, which shows that if it exists or meaningful, it certainly is not unitary. So such theories uh, were uh, discarded for obvious reasons uh, when I studied conformal field theory in high school and then in my undergraduate uh, education. So I was basically told to not look at these theories at all. And little did I know that they would actually enter physics. The argument back then that was given to me is that don't look at them, they're non-unitary, so they have no place in physics. But uh, in the early 90s, John Cardi and others found the role for this series uh, in precisely these models that I just mentioned. For instance, he proposed that percolation can be described by a logarithmic non-unitary CFT uh, with central charge equal zero. He computed the probability of a horizontal crossing from one side to another using four point correlation function of this logarithmic CFT. And um, then this density of loops uh, with area A uh, that, that's shown on a slide was known numerically uh, and, and the value, the second value shown is as a numerical prediction, but he actually gave using this logarithmic uh, VOA a prediction for what it should be analytically and that's one over eight square root of three pi, which matches the measured value with amazing accuracy. So I hope uh, my papers uh, get, get that sort of accuracy and connection with reality. So Logarithmic CFTs, even though they are non-unitary because correlators have logarithms, modular transformations have logarithms, they actually do have connection to real physics and in fact, quite, quite exciting connection. However, because the subject was kind of a taboo in early days uh, and then very few people ventured in this non-unitary land, if you open a textbook on logarithmic VOAs, you're not going to find much. In fact, there is no textbook on logarithmic VOAs. And we have many examples of rational CFTs and rational VOAs. But if you try to ask which logarithmic VOA should we use for Cardi's prediction, there are very few candidates. In fact, in the literature, there are basically three infinite families that go by the name symplectic fermions, triplet, and singlet models. Each family is labeled by one integer. In the case of symplectic fermions, it's basically a number of their copies. And it's a version of beta gamma system, nothing mysterious. Two other models are somewhat more interesting. And uh, here I give you a basic characteristic of uh, vertex algebra, namely its central charge, um, which indicates that these models are non-unitary because for most values of this parameters D or P, as you can see, the values are negative. So, and then unitary CFTs cannot have negative central charges. So, Aside from beta gamma system or symplectic fermions, the triplet and singlet are more interesting logarithmic CFTs. These are pretty much the only log CFTs that you can find on the market if you try to buy them. And uh, they're kind of fit into more familiar ones. If you have a lattice such as a weight lattice of a Lie algebra, you can form uh, a very standard construction of a chiral algebra known as lattice VOA. And you can also define a fine W algebra if your root system of, is of AD type. There are generalizations for other kinds. So these models, singlet and triplet that I mentioned, fit into this chain of embeddings. So they're not totally esoteric, but they're somewhat interesting and, and seed between lattice VOA and uh, W algebra in a subsequent chain of embeddings. In fact, um, the difference between a singlet model and triplet model is uh, rather simple. A uh, triplet model has action of SU2. And if you focus on uh, 
uh, global symmetry uh, SU2 or a fine um, SU2 Katsumudi symmetry. And if you focus on a singlet sector of that SU2 or SL2, you get precisely the singlet VOA. So that's how you cut in the middle from triplet to singlet. And its corresponding character is just a constant term in the triplet character. So that explains the name singlet, among other things. Constructing the triplet itself is a little bit more interesting. And um, those of you who know how Felder constructed minimal models out of uh, free CFTs, he considered a cohomology of a certain operator, think of it as a BRST operator, uh, acting on the space of states in the free CFT. So what Fagan and Tipunin proposed is that instead of taking cohomology with respect to that Q operator, you can actually take just the kernel. So it modifies the construction. And as a result, you would get a, a logarithmic vertex algebra. So short way of saying what this triplet is, is it's a kernel rather than cohomology, analog of uh, famous Felder's construction of minimal models and other CFTs. So it turns out that these models, which is pretty much all you can find uh, on the market of logarithmic VOAs, show up in the world of three manifolds. So a natural question so far could be, uh, okay, I told you a little bit how they appear in physics. What do they have to do with topology and in particular three manifolds? So in the remaining uh, 15 minutes or so, my job is to describe how to compute certain invariants of three manifolds, which produce uh, characters of these algebras, and they correspondingly have interesting modular properties such as weight one half, weight three half, mock modular forms, mock modular forms of higher depth, and uh, perhaps more exotic objects um, that we, we don't even know how to, describe, how to describe in the modular world. So this dictionary is precisely the dictionary between low dimensional topology and chiral algebra and number theory that I alluded to in the beginning. And uh, for the sake of chiral algebras, it actually serves a very good purpose. It tells us where to look for this logarithmic VOAs. As I mentioned, they're very strange, they're unusual, esoteric. So um, this connection, this bridge uh, provides some guidance on how to construct new examples of logarithmic vertex algebras. Uh, some of which have, have been done in our work that I mentioned, as well as in collaboration of Catherine Bringman, Carl Marbrook, and uh, Anton Miller. Any questions uh, on this part? If not, I'll go to the last story and uh, bring three manifolds back, back in the game. So, Sergey, is there any relation between um... So you have this character of the VOA of M3. Then there are other things we can associate to T of M3, like superconformal indices and hemisphere partition functions. Are these things related? Uh, what I'm going to describe these characters are precisely the uh, partition functions on a solid torus. So that's what I mentioned in passing. This half indices, where you have 3D theory with a 0 to boundary condition, gives you these characters. Again, I won't use these names or physics terminology again. Um, other things uh, in T of M3 produce something else, but, but the connection with characters is this. It's basically partition function on, on a solid torus. Is there a choice of two-dimensional theory on the boundary torus? Yes, and it, it, it will come up in a second. Yes, I'll, exactly. At least, uh, yeah. I'll give you some space of choices, which are good choices. Yeah. That's right. So, um, right. So I, I need to bring three manifolds in the game. And um, uh, famous theorem of Likerich, Wallace, and Kirby says that every three manifold can be constructed out of a knot or a link. So if you're given a knot or a link in a three sphere, you can excavate its tubular neighborhood and uh, then glue it back. And in general, this operation is called rational Dane surgery because the coefficient that controls the gluing is, is a rational number. But in fact, the theorem says that you can just get away if you do integer surgeries and consider more complicated knots and links. Um, 
there are some equivalence relations on this construction um, that are called Kirby moves. Uh, and that's where, why I included the name of, of Rob Kirby uh, in, in this theorem, because he proved that these are the only equivalence relations you ever need or ever encounter in trying to construct three manifolds out of such diagrams of knots and links. Now, suppose your diagram of a knot or a link is made only of most simplest and most basic unknots. So then you can encode the data of such knot diagram or link diagram on the left in terms of a graph. If you associate each component to a node or vertex, and every time two components of a link are actually linked, you draw an edge between them. So then you get a graph and that actually allows you to encode all the relevant information. So basically you can think of world of three manifolds, which is of course very rich, very complicated as a glorified version or bigger set as, as a set of all such possible graphs where uh, to be fully general, we need to replace nodes by general knots. So that's, that's something we'll do in a second. But let's start with graphs first because that's a nice combinatorial data. And to every such graph, we'll associate uh, a partition function. Think about it as a way of associating uh, an integral to a Feynman diagram, for example. So this, this graph will be analog of input data. And um, a basic ingredient in this construction is a quadratic form, which is adjacent symmetrics of this graph. So it has this integer coefficients that represent integral dense surgeries on a diagonal. And every time two nodes get linked, the corresponding matrix element will be one, otherwise it's zero. Then as in any good statistical model or is in the Feynman diagram calculation, you can associate a basic building block of such partition function to each element. So given a vertex, we'll associate to it a function of uh, a variable x that, that will be integrating over. And to edge, we'll associate a function of two variables that correspond to nodes, uh, which the edge is connecting. And then we take a product over all possible vertices and edges and integrate with additional factor, which is a theta function of the quadratic form Q that, that you can associate to this. So basically, if your graph has uh, nine or 10 vertices, it will be very big nine, nine tuple integral. So it's a very big multiple integral, but all these variables x1, x2, and so on will disappear in the end. And only variable q, which enters theta function and, and some of these factors will survive. So we'll basically get a q series as a result of such integration. Does q have to be positive definite? Uh, Q has, uh, capital Q has to be, in my notation, I think it's negative definite, I actually write it. Or may, maybe, yeah, here it's uh, negative definite, yeah. Uh, that's right. So let's let's assume that Q is ne negative definite. So that and restricts what manifolds you can look at? Exactly. So at first it restricts what manifolds we can look at, but we already made a restriction first that we're looking only at this at this class of so-called graph manifolds or plumb manifolds. So that's already a huge restriction. Right. So what, is there some characterization of what three manifolds, like are they particular kinds of ciphered manifolds or something? No, this uh, cipher, there's a small class here uh, and these are called definite plumb manifolds. But it, it's not important because in a second, I'll tell you how to generalize it, how, how to relax all of uh, some of these assumptions. So it, it's, it's a big class which subsumes all ciphered manifolds. It's a strictly bigger, in fact, infinitely bigger, but uh, it's, it's also infinitely less than, than all three manifolds. Yeah. So good thing about this graph manifolds or plumb manifolds with definite Q is that, uh, again, you can just plug this into the, the formula for this partition function and you produce a Q series. And um, that's, that's precisely this invariant, which takes values in Q series that, um, I'm trying to uh, explore. And uh, one easy thing is that you can prove that uh, this guy is invariant under Kirby moves. So that's that's first simple statement. First, you can prove this, for example, in the class of this plan manifolds where the statement is already meaningful and non-trivial. So it produces you a way to associate invariant to a manifold and it doesn't care how exactly we constructed the three manifold. It 
according to allowed equivalences. And the second thing we need to actually apply it to general three manifolds, so that's important to answer uh, your question, Greg, uh, is to replace now unknots which were used in this construction by general knots. But remember, in this general multiple integral, we have for every copy of unknot, we have some integrand which depends on that particular variable xi that we're integrating over, or z z in this uh, in this slide. So therefore, what we need. If we want to modify unknot by to, to, to replace it by some other knot, such as figure eight or trefoil or anything you want, we need to modify the integrand. So we need the function of q and x that we need to stick in the integrand that hopefully will give us invariant and will be invariant under Kirby moves. So where do we get this function? So this function as a function of q and x, we can get from a polynomial. So this does connect to, to the early slide in uh, early part of the talk, because uh, such function in fact was already available uh, more than 10 years ago. For instance, we developed some of this theory with Don Zagir, Tudor de Moft and Jonathan Lennels, where for every non complement, we found a way to compute this uh, partition function uh, perturbatively meaning to any order in H bar expansion. And what we didn't realize back then is that there is something cool about that, that, that function. We never looked because this expansion in H bar, perturbative expansion, even though we could do it to all orders, that's why the name exact appears as part of the title of this paper, but it didn't look good. It, it, it looked like it's total junk. It had the rational coefficients and in this exponential of one over H bar and so on, this whole series looked really horrible. But something that- hey, yeah. hey. Could I ask one question? So in this computation, are you using this uh, business about annihilation by the A polynomial? Yeah, yes, exactly. That's where this annihilation by A polynomial or integral over A polynomial, there are several ways to rephrase it. Mm -hmm. Or topological recursion based on A polynomial immediately gives you answer to, to, to all orders. So basically that's what we did back, back in the day. Um, but what we didn't notice is something that uh, actually appears in a different subject. When people study Donaldson Thomas invariants, um, they use this kind of double exponential relation. I call it double exponential because it involves two exponents. First, you replace your formal expansion variable h bar, which is assumed to be small, by <coughs> exponential of h bar. And then that limit in that variable, perturbative analysis is when q goes to one. This is the limit q goes to one. And then you do something else. You also write your exponential of free energy, which is exponential of one over h bar times classical action and so on and so forth. In, you try to exponentiate this whole series, which appears on the right. And you write it in terms of variable q. So that's the second exponential. So in other words, you're exponentiating the variable h bar and you're also exponentiating the perturbative series. And if you borrow some lessons from Donaldson Thomas theory, you should expect that now result is going to be nice series in Q, in fact, with integer coefficients. So this is something we didn't notice back then, 10 years ago, even though all results were available. So this is actually one of these results for the trefoil knot. So it's here it's written as a function of variable X and variable H bar just like in these old days. So that's something you can compute in many different ways from this A polynomial curve. And we never looked at it, but uh, if you take that series and exponentiate it, what you find is, is this. And let's look at this table. Now, uh, by table, I mean organize it uh, in terms of uh, double expansion and X and H bar and focus on a specific coefficient of X, for example. So here, I focus on coefficient of x to one half. And then my normalization here, powers are half integer. So then what you see is uh, series and h bar, and that series is one plus h bar plus h square over two plus h cube over six. And of course we know what the series is. It's basically q, it's exponential of h bar. And if you do this with any other coefficient, same thing will happen. So in this case, you don't need any fancy technology such as Borel resummation and other things that people use. You can just notice with the naked eye that this is a Q series. And, and I kick myself for not noticing this all along. But 
As a result, what it gives you is you basically rewrite that perturbative series on h bar and x now in terms of variable q. It depends on x. You stick this back into integrand, and this allows you to compute any surgery on any other knot or link in, in that formula. So with cheaper in Manales, could we did it for a handful of knots. So this is answer for figure eight. Again, you can get it in several different ways now. And the upshot is that basically the, this, this machinery now works and allows to answer questions such as the one Greg was asking about generalizations going away from uh, chains of unknots to any knots and links and also to, to consider indefinite plumbings or indefinite, in fact, surgeries where surgery metrics has coefficients of plus and minus values. So here is an example. Um, this is manifold which can be produced from two different knots by doing plus one surgery on figure eight knot or minus one surgery on a trefoil knot. And now using this generalization, this technology that I just outlined, you can actually do this computation stick into, into this integral and you produce the same answer, which first of all looks like this. So it's it's a particular Q series. It um, is nice convergent Q series inside the union disk. And moreover, surprisingly, it turns out to be character of a logarithmic vertex algebra. So and also the inverse of the quantum dilogarithm. Um, so, sorry, say again. I think it's the inverse of the quantum dilogarithm. Um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a slightly more complicated function. It's one of this Ramanujan's uh, functions that he wrote in, in his uh, letter to Hardy, actually. So it's, it's, it's uh, so-called order seven uh, mock theta function in his terminology. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's a slightly more interesting thing. And uh, it's, it's, it's modular, but it's not quite modular. So the, the, therefore, uh, many of these things turn out to be mock and higher depth mock and so on. And more interestingly, it's also character of this uh, one comma P singlet logarithmic vertex algebra. I showed you this whole family labeled by P. And for this manifold, it happens that P is equal to 42. So, um, when Mike Friedman saw a version of the stock, he immediately jumped out of the audience and said, oh, 42 is the answer to the question about the meaning of life and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, of course, here in this example, 42 is just controlled by topology of the manifold. In fact, you can get analogous uh, characters for any other value of P. But to me personally, it's, it's, it's really magical and interesting that such logarithmic vertex algebras appear. Um, they provide, if we dig deeper, ways of generalizing constructions of logarithmic VOAs. And uh, when I started to work on this, I had absolutely no interest in, in logarithmic vertex algebras, logarithmic CFTs, or uh, this more interesting modular tensor categories. So the fact that they come out as invariants of manifolds is, um, is, is, is surprising. And uh, maybe I'll finish with uh, one more slide, which is also surprising and also interesting. And in fact, it's precisely about this going from negative definite to positive definite. Uh, it's an operation which is very simple in topology. So every manifold has a uh, manifold of opposite orientation. It may happen to be the same or different. Uh, most of the time, of course, it's different. And if you follow from uh, the, the, this construction, it's clear that, uh, and also it's clear from Schoen Simon's theory that morally what should happen is that Q should be inverted to Q inverse. But the invariants that we associate to all these manifolds, M3 or minus M3, are Q series written in terms of Q. So therefore, it provides an interesting kind of question where uh, if one of them is character of a chiral algebra written in terms of Q, then the other invariant for obtained from manifold with opposite orientation uh, is also a Q series, but it morally should be the same character chi as for the original algebra written in terms of Q inverse. So this kind of things play a very important role in number theory in understanding failure of modularity of, of mock and higher depth mock modular objects where we try to go from upper half plane to lower half plane. 
And morally, these two objects uh, are analytic continuations of each other. So here, if they get interpreted as characters, they suggest that there is some kind of mirror symmetry, some operation on chiral algebras, uh, which are related by uh, taking characters of one and trying to rewrite it in terms of Q inverse and then re-expanding back in terms of Q. So I have no idea what the separation is in the world of chiral algebras. It's clear what it is physically, it's clear what it's topologically, just orientation reversal. But uh, examples of such phenomena where we even have expression for both characters on both sides are rare and always interesting. So this is uh, in, in, in modularity story is, is, is a very mysterious and cool phenomenon that uh, gets into recent work of, uh, in fact, Catherine, Catherine Brinkman is, is perhaps one of the leaders in this field who has done a lot of things uh, that, that um, are examples of, of, of this type of phenomenon. So I think I ran over time already, although we started late, but I think that's a good place to stop anyway. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, maybe I could sneak in a, a question <laughs> before others start. Uh, again, we're just uh, naturally transitioning into this discussion session. Uh, but earlier on, you were saying that this modular tensor category associated to a three manifold you uses this 60 theory, right? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that there, the 60 theory, when you take a product with this M, with this three manifold, gives you a 3D topological quantum field theory or something, and there's a modular tensor category for that. That's the rough idea. That's uh, th that's actually very close to the how exactly it arises. Yeah, right. indeed. Uh, but I, I guess you're also saying that that modular tensor category is associated to a vertex operator algebra? Uh, not quite. So I, I, I said several times that they're related, but right. uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. You right. wouldn't have the full right to ask me, what is the relation between this chiral algebra and that MTC? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, for, uh, for, for example, for Poincaré sphere, the MTC that, that had connections to perverse homology of Abuzdeit Manalescu or um, uh, the, the skein module, that was three dimensional. Yeah. But for Poincaré sphere, if you compute this Q series, it will be a character of um, logarithmic uh, singlet VOA, just like this one, except yeah. the value of P will be 30. Yeah. And that fellow has uh, four times P character. So it will be modular representation of size 120. Mm -hmm. So you see they're very different. So the, the, this, this could say that, uh, oh, they're, they're not related, but actually uh, there is a way to identify three dimensional SL20 representation out of this logarithmic VOA with P equals 30. So uh, mm -hmm. in fact, one is always smaller than the other. So. MTC that we discussed early on is actually subcategory in, in this bigger MTC that services representations of this chiral algebra. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe I, sorry, I'm, I'm dominating the questions, but I, I, maybe I could just ask one more thing before opening it up to other questions. I don't, I didn't quite capture uh, what the connection to arithmetic topology. Well, I don't know uh, connection to, yeah, so th th that I didn't discuss uh, at all. So mm -hmm. connection to arithmetic topology is still a mystery to me. And uh, uh, it was, I used it as a motivation to say that wow. uh, we want to study um, this uh, triangle with three corners, number theory, chiral algebras, and then uh, three manifolds. So it still is a program to me and a uh, motivation, but. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, where is it? Well, anybody, of course, is free to jump in with questions. No other questions? <laughs> oh, of course, um, I yeah. mean, uh, okay. some things that one can try to say about connection to arithmetic topology, but uh, my, my personal hope and uh, mm. uh, is, is that some of these things uh, 
will eventually fill the gaps that we need to fill in arithmetic topology. And I would be glad to hear thoughts or suggestions or come back to this myself one day. Right. Uh, well, actually, if it's okay, then is it? Could you, since nobody else is asking questions, could you uh, answer, uh, give an outline of what I asked about earlier? How this prediction about dimensions of scanning models, modules come out of this physics? Uh, yes. Uh, um, right. That's um, uh, so. So the key word in 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 some sense um, is. Um, so, so there, are, there are two two versions of the answer. One one is still uh, cheating a little bit because uh, all this S and T matrices that I showed uh, in that part can be expressed in terms of invariance of a three manifold. So, for instance, I mentioned that uh, values of the uh, logs of eigenvalues of the T matrix can be expressed in terms of Chern Simons functional evaluated on the corresponding connection. So if there are isolated connections like for Poincare sphere, mm -hmm. you can just take the corresponding values and that will give you values of T matrix. So for S matrix, you can do so something similar, but what will happen is that <clears throat> Redemeister torsion uh, of various connections will come in and close cousins of Redemeister torsion. But now I'm cheating because I'm still using, all I'm saying is that there is a way to express values of S and T matrix in terms of classical or familiar invariance of three manifolds. Right. Um, the actual answer that's that's uh, doing the job here and then that will be crucial in examples like a three torus where connections are not isolated. The character variety is not just isolated set of points. Even mm -hmm. if you throw away reducibles, it's, um, um, it's, 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 it's a variety. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's going to be crucial in examples like this is to consider, roughly speaking, a quantum K theory of the character variety of the SL2C character variety mm. of the three manifold. Right. So that's 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 going to be this finite dimensional thing. Right. So quantum K theory. Mm -hmm. Now, in works on quantum K theory, so so that's a mathematically well defined object, and it's. Uh, you, one, one can go ahead and study it. And uh, in developing quantum K theory, um, people like Givental, um, his collaborators, or, or it also appeared in works of Nekros, of Okunkov, uh, Nekros of Shatashvili and others, um, they found a nice way of encoding the information of, of this quantum K theory, for example, the, the ring structure in terms of so-called uh, beta ansatz equations. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 these are key words if you really want to understand what's going on there. That's and the, the point, comes in, yeah. yeah, that's mm -hmm. the, the physics basically explains how to associate beta and that's equation and some Landau Ginzburg model to such character variety. But mm -hmm. the final result can be formulated just mathematically as again as quantum key theory. And cool thing is that um, the, this beta and that's equation has finitely many solutions. So mm -hmm. for Poincaré sphere, it's going to be three solutions. Right. And for three-dimensional torus, it's going to be nine solutions. Mm -hmm. So it's the basis of those solutions uh, which will furnish the vector space on which SL2Z is acting. Uh -huh. so so if, I, if I say very superficially, this association of the Vetans that's to the character variety, this is some duality? Um, yeah, you can uh, you can think uh, about it in this way. Yeah, yeah. So okay. a physicist would, would would go about it in in the following way. A physicist would say first of all, character variety is a Keller manifold, possibly yeah. or variety possibly singular. So mm -hmm. a physicist first of all would real, would ask if I take three dimensional n equals two theory with a target right. uh, as right. as a UV theory, what will be the infrared physics of that right. theory? Mm -hmm. and, and that would be controlled by landau Ginzburg model uh, with a potential, which yeah. is uh, whose critical point, I mean, which, which gives you this better on that equation. Yeah, no, okay, I, I think I get the rough idea. So it's not a fancy duality. It's not like one of these S dualities or SL2Z mm -hmm. dualities. It's mm -hmm. actually just a flow from UV to IR in the physics think, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Any other questions? Uh, 
possibly there was too much information for <laughs> to be too much well, questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there were also some questions dur during the talk, so yeah. I'll, I'll be glad to answer any more questions uh, later by email or at any point. I guess I I have a question that's sort of a, not as directly related to your talk, um, sure. but. But whenever somebody mentions mentions the connection between volumes of hyperbolic manifolds and regulators, I, I, I keep thinking, well, what about piatic regulators? And could there be some sort of piatic volume? Mm -hmm. Probably, uh, yes. And I think that's very meaningful. In fact, that's, yeah, that would fit on this course that I heard from Fernando very, very well. So, um, Actually, yeah. I meant to ask, sorry, this is quite sort of an interruption to that question, but I think it's related. So uh, I don't, I heard about this work of Fernando, but I never looked at it. But it, so if you look, so you said the Mahler measure of, of the A polynomial is mm -hmm. the volume of the, of the hyperbolic stream and of the not complement, right? Mm -hmm. is, is there a physics interpretation of this formula? Uh, yeah, so th that basically, uh, was uh, at least to me the clearest way to understand that is in the context of this Charles Simons theory with this mm -hmm. L2CH group, because uh, what happens, and in fact that, that interpretation explains why it works, why it doesn't work. So David Boyd had a couple of papers which got Fernando interested in the subject mm -hmm. uh, before he gave this course at Harvard, mm -hmm. and um, 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 David Boyd observed and, and Fernando continued with him that in some examples, Miller measure is the hyperbolic volume. In some cases, it's not. So again, it seemed like one of these intriguing things when half the time it's working, <clears> half <throat> the time it's not as giving you something similar that needs correction, but it was very mysterious, like what, what's going on? Mm -hmm. So the stern simon theory actually explains this uh, to, to, to great extent. And the connection is, is the following. So both Miller measure and hyperbolic volume can be formulated as integrals um, uh, on a certain path on the A polynomial curve. So maybe I'll go back to, to, to sharing the screen and show I had kind of a uh, slide for this uh, uh, in a very, in passing. I didn't plan to talk about it, but the picture is actually there. So it's, it's uh, the, this a polynomial curve and we're integrating log y d log x mm -hmm. along, along the curve. So both Miller measure and hyperbolic volume can be expressed in terms of such integrals, but the integration path is not always the same for, for them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's true that for always for any not, uh, Miller measure of a polynomial curve is, is one integral, hyperbolic volume is another integral, but of course, as a polynomial gets larger and there is more uh, room for homotopy classes of paths to consider, so they, they may not necessarily match, and uh, that's exactly what happens. But in examples like figure eight not and small examples, uh, it it's often happens that, that, uh, that they actually do match. Oh, I see. But, so I guess I, I, I didn't know that. Uh, I can see how the Mahler measure is given by an integration along some curve of, of the polynomial. But you're saying that also works for the hyperbolic volume, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's basically the key. That's the common denominator in the relation or in trying to understand what's going on. But you're saying that that the interpretation of the hyperbolic volume as an integral of the a polynomial is something that comes from Trent Simon theory. Is that what you say? Yeah, that, that's, that basically comes from Trent Simon's theory because uh, see, you have a symplectic form yeah. on ambient space. So that's uh, d log y d log x. Yeah. So then you have a Lagrangian submanifold given by zero locus of a polynomial. Right. So uh, in quantum mechanics, we learned that if we have Lagrangian submanifold that determines state of a system yeah. and semi-classical wave function, the leading classical term in this wave function is integral of PDQ. Right, so yeah. that's precisely the integral of log y d log x in this case. So, so yeah, I'm being very slow, but why does that give you the hyperbolic volume of the not complement? Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. So here there is another piece of information that uh, it gives, uh, right, it gives in general complex Chern Simons action. So it yeah. gives SL2C action. And in fact, um, 
given your manifolds, if, if you want a hyperbolic manifold, there may be lots of, um, um, uh, right, a lots of SL2C flat connections, but on a hyperbolic knot complement, there is always one branch, mm. a particular flat SL2C connection, which gives the hyperbolic volume as the value of complex trans Simons functional. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm using also the fact that complexified, in fact, not just hyperbolic volume, complexified uh, hyperbolic okay. volume right. is, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the, uh, the way the complex transignments function functional comes out of this is just by the semi-classical construction of the wave function associated to a Lagrangian submanifold. That's what you were saying, right? Uh, exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. No, so do. right. So I'm using the fact that in Trans-Simons theory, the semi-classical wave function mm -hmm. gives complex Trans-Simons action on the one hand. Then, if if we're in the world of hyperbolic knot complements, that has geometric meaning as, as the volume. hyperbolic volume or its complexification. And uh, then I'm using the fact that on the other side, for the Miller measure, there is a similar expression. So question in each case becomes. Uh, to compare homotopy classes of paths on this apron and level curve. And okay. if they coincide, we're in business. I see, that's interesting. But that's not how Fernando proved it, I guess. I, I think now, now he, I'm sure, knows uh, this perspective and maybe even uses it. But indeed, in, in the course, uh, mm -hmm. and how David Boyd observed this uh, and Fernando observed that this was uh, quite different. So in fact, uh, that, that was part of my motivation to understand what's going on. Yeah. Mm, interesting. So this business of the Trent Simons interpretation, that's also all written down somewhere, I suppose, right? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I had a paper on a polynomial insurance Simons theory oh, back okay, in yeah, 2003, right. which so, so I know that was paper. basically a product of this. Uh, I see. Okay, great. Right. Talk, yeah. Talking to, to these people, yeah. Mm, thank you. Well, I guess if there are no other questions, we can adjourn for the evening then. Well, thank you again. And, no, uh, thank you again. I guess I'll... Talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, have See a you next time. Bye-bye.